This is episode 19 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm Andrew Hines, and thank you very much for continuing to listen to this podcast. Thank you very much to everyone who has subscribed and reviewed this podcast and even shared it with their friends. Um, I've absolutely enjoyed this process of connecting with so many new people because of this. I also wanted to mention that we've booked a date for the next Greater Hamilton Area Real Estate Investor Meetup. And it's going to be on May the 23rd at 7 p.m. That's the Thursday. And it's at Jack Astor's in Burlington. So if you are in the greater Hamilton area or willing to travel to Burlington that night, we'd love to have you. Uh, If you're a a real estate investor that's active and looking to network and connect with other fellow real estate investors that are doing deals, our last meetup was a huge success. It was uh, really motivating to myself and I know a lot of other people and I'm really looking forward to seeing this grow. So please, if you are, are interested, hit me up on Instagram at Hines or on Facebook at The Andrew Hines, and I will get you added to the group so that I can share the event details with you. Today's episode, we have Jazz Takhar on the show, and Jazz is a realtor out of Toronto. He actually happens to manage one of the top performing teams in the entire country, so he's a very successful entrepreneur and realtor, as well as an investor in pre-construction. So this is a regular part of his investment strategy, And today, we're going to be talking about how he executes his strategy and how he comes up with consistently $150,000 plus in instant equity when he closes on his pre-construction properties by buying smart. He's going to get into the tricks of the trade. He's going to get into how he vets deals and even what he does for his clients Uh, as well as talking about his own podcast and some of the things he's up to. So it's a really interesting episode. It's very different from the other episodes that we've had so far. And I was really excited to have this because it's, uh, like I said, it's a very unique take. So without further ado, here is the episode with Jazz Takar. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm here with Jazz Takar. You said that really well, buddy. I've been practicing. (laughs) And uh, Jazz is a real estate investor, but also is involved in operating and running one of the largest real estate brokerages in Canada or? Yeah, look, uh, we're under the umbrella of Royal LePage Canada Mm -hmm. that has um, 18,000 realtors right across the country. Myself and my partner uh, have a team that we brand as REC, which stands for Real Estate Center. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have uh, a team of 25 realtors that covers the greater Toronto area. And uh, we got number three last year for the country. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. Before I go any further, thanks for having me on the show, my friend. Well, thanks for taking the time. So I know, uh, obviously, I came up to your studio. So for yeah. those watching, uh, this is this is where your podcast happens. Yes, yeah. So uh, just for for the people who aren't familiar with that, what's uh, what's it called, and where can they find it? Awesome, man. Um, so on all podcast platforms, mm-hmm. uh, uh, iTunes, Spotify, uh, po- uh, Podcast Attic, anywhere you can listen to a podcast, mm-hmm. search REC Experience. Okay. We do have uh, we do film all of our podcasts as well, yeah. um, and you can find that on YouTube dot com forward slash rec experience uh we're at our third season now in total we're we're, we're coming up to episode 54 55 yeah um, don't quote me on that um and uh it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun like i can tell that yeah. when i've been when i've heard yours and seen yours andrew like there's a lot of passion that comes out, man, and yeah. and and so I too have a lot of passion on not, not passion for not only real estate, but as you can probably see behind me, it says real estate entrepreneurship and yeah. leadership. Those two other topics, I like to sprinkle them in because I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship, leading a team of not only the 25 realtors, but we have 10 support staff. My partner and I, we're young guys. We like to have a lot of fun. There's a lot of ups and downs in entrepreneurship. There's been lots of successes but there's also been lots of failures right and uh i think that through the podcast we are doing trying to do our best to document all all successes and failures as well 
hey, that's what that's what it takes to be real, right? So true, man. And and I know we were speaking about this before the episode, but I just wanted to reiterate. So I intentionally didn't didn't look up on you before, didn't didn't do the yeah. research on you before because yeah. I wanted this to be authentic. I wanted awesome. it to be like for the first time, yeah. I'm asking you the questions and I really don't know the answers. Yeah, cool. Which I've I've taken this approach lately because it's just you never know where the conversation might For go. Sure. Now I think there might be some success and failure with that too. Yeah, but, no, uh, but you know what? I, yeah. I I actually agree with you. Yeah. So um, just quickly, like yeah. our first season was seventeen episodes. You mentioned this is that you've done now seventeen episodes. Mm-hmm. So it's funny that you mentioned that number. And I sat down with my partner and our executive producer, and we sat and we said, look. For the first 10 out of that 17, it was very scripted. Yeah. Um, in fact, I used to have a piece of paper, if you mm-hmm. look at some of the videos, and I would ask a lot of the questions. I myself, I'm, I'm, I was never good at school. I, it wasn't my forte. I like to go off the cuff. Yeah. And what I found after those first 17 episodes, it's just more authenticity that came yeah. out, and uh, there was just a lot more banter. And so I totally agree with you, man. Yeah. Like, just go at it. You're good. Like, I, I've seen what you've been doing. Um, and and you're very easy to talk to so i would definitely go all in with that yeah i talk a lot <laughs> for better i'm or sure your close friends and family <laughs> tell you that all the time uh i get the same yeah. thing I, 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 that's why it made sense for us to do podcasts yeah. right because now you could go all on and just yeah. talk and you'll decide what you want to post produce yeah. afterwards right <laughs> yes if i need to cut out a, a few minutes i i will of course i don't really do much of that i i, I shoot at home with with the dog so occasionally he'll bark so i'll cut those parts out but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways this is uh, this is really refreshing you have a, an awesome studio an thank awesome you. setup here and thank you and what i wanted to ask you today because I had heard that you were investing into some pre-construction, yeah. which I have not had anyone on the on the show talk about a pre-construction investing strategy. So yeah. I wanted to ask you about you personally. Yeah. What are you into? Obviously cover that part, but what else? And what's your personal philosophy? Well, I, I'm going to say about you know uh, eight to ten years ago, we in in the city of Toronto specifically, we started to see the shift right with with about uh, 18, 19 years ago, the Greenbelt legislation came in into place for uh, the province of Ontario, which essentially restricted uh, uh, certain areas that developers could not build on. So they no longer could build out subdivisions this way. You started to see a huge influx of applications being put in for condos okay where developers can just make more money because they're able to build more units in one spot you started to see a lot of the parking lots downtown Mm -hmm. toronto being sold out i mean now sitting here into mid 2019 there's very little parking vacant parking lots in downtown toronto knowing that the shift was starting to happen myself and my partner uh, made a decision that this is where we're going to focus on through our own portfolio but also helping other investors because you can buy now a condo uh, with 20 percent down uh, you know in and around on an average square footage of 500 uh, square feet I know that sounds small, but it does. It it does. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. But the guy, the the tenants that are living in these places, they use them essentially as hotels, right? So 500 square feet, there's a lot of furniture stores now made specifically for condos. Um, But you can purchase with 20% down. So it's if it's, let's just for even numbers, you're looking at $500,000, you're going to put $100,000 down, you're able to rent out those condos, the rental income will cover your expenses. Now, a lot of people would sit and say, well, I'm not making much cash flow. But there's other ways you win yes. in real estate investing, as you and I know, and I'm sure most of your viewers and listeners know, that it's not always about the cash flow. Even if you were making two, $300 a month, that's nothing to really write home yeah. about. It's the passive appreciation. It's the principal recapture, yep. the, the, when, how much your mortgage is being paid down. But just with the passive appreciation in downtown Toronto for the last 15 years, we've been looking at 75 to 8.5% year over year over year. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to beat that when yeah. you, when you build in the leverage, right? Because because yeah. your your down payment's not going up by seven eight percent. Exactly, it's the entire asset. So it, so the more you can leverage and then re leverage. So if, if if you're getting that. In two, three years' time, you could refinance and almost pull all your money out. Oh, well, I mean, Andrew, that's exactly yeah. what myself and my partner do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I make mention of my partner a few times, obviously, because we do do joint ventures generally together, mm-hmm. um, only because we're in the business. It's easy for us to to pick a project mm-hmm. and then and then rent it out and manage it. We also do the, the same for our investors. So we'll help them select mm-hmm. a location. So we like to look at three things when it comes to pre-construction. 
location. Can't pick up okay. the building and move it. I personally, in my portfolio, like to stick around downtown Toronto okay. because it's where all the jobs are. So for any of our your outside, uh, out-of-province listeners or, or viewers, in downtown Toronto, we have the major banks. Yes. We have Bay Street. We have the major universities. We have the major uh, hospitals. And now our tech sector is blowing up. Right. I mean, you have Uber down there. You have Shopify coming. Google in the south uh, uh, east part of, of the downtown corridor is building out a, a smart neighborhood. Okay. Right. And so with all these jobs coming, we know that most younger people in that age group of 25 to 35, they all want to live where they work. Yes. So they can walk to work. I mean, I, 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 I know we're jumping off, going off on tangents, but, you know, my cousins from that age group of 22 to 26, they still don't even have their driver's license because yeah. they Uber around, they bike or they walk, right? Absolutely. And- yeah. Well, I think downtown Toronto is, um, it's, it's probably in an earlier stage than cities like, well, Manhattan and, 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 and some of the others that have really developed subway systems, transit systems, like Toronto is behind on that. Big time. And, I mean, we, we, we're seeing yeah. the Manhattanization effect yes. here in Toronto now. Yeah. Um, I did want to also talk about the other two parts that we do due diligence on, which yeah. is obviously the builder, okay. because we want to make sure that the builder, this is not their first time at the rodeo, right? That We want to make sure that they have yeah. a good reputation. We can see places that they've built before, so we can walk in, touch it, see it, smell it, see their yeah. finishes. Um, and then third, last but not least, obviously, is the incentives that are being offered to investors. Okay. Because as an investor, you need to have three, four incentives that are in place that to an end user, it doesn't matter. So explain what are the incentives. Okay, so what we're always looking for is you want to be able to, and not in any particular order, but uh, you want to make sure that there's an, a clause for an assignment. Okay. It, it was a ri- so it's called an assignment clause. Um, it's usually a four to five thousand uh, dollar cost to do an assignment, and we make sure that we get that for at least you know a thousand dollars or free. Mm-hmm. What the assignment allows you to do is that because you're buying something today, buying a condo today from a blueprint essentially, that's going to be built out for two to three, four years from now. Yeah. Life happens. Financial hardship can happen. Something can come up where you need to be able to take that agreement of purchase and sale and flip it to, right. to another end user, purchaser, or investor. So you're saying that you may buy something, um, say five years ago you bought something that you haven't closed on yet. Does that does that exist that, right now? That's a huge, okay. huge uh, uh, type of investment to, yeah. to to get a lot of income. Okay, so you so we'll just take a step back and simplify yeah. this because I know some people are this is completely foreign to them. So cool. so you see a building, maybe you have a relationship with that builder, or maybe yeah. they just put an advertisement out that they're selling units. Yeah. You go to them, you write them an offer yeah. on their paperwork, yeah. but you include a clause that says I have the right to assign this to another buyer if I choose before yes. closing. So you can do that with a lawyer before closing yep. works out just fine so you buy say back in 2015 yeah and you've got one that you're maybe getting ready to close on now uh, maybe you change your mind and how much money are you potentially making in a scenario like that well so it's a and i'm going to answer that question okay. so the clause of, uh, yeah. uh, originally came into play for somebody who might have some financial hardship and they can't close. They can't close, okay. okay. But what started to happen in the city of Toronto as value started to increase from something that was bought back in 2015 to now, yeah. all, most investors use that clause to make a profit. To make a profit, So to answer yeah. your question, I mean, I've seen anywhere from 100000 to two hundred to $225,000 made. Right. The longer period of time, so mm-hmm. in your situation, in your example, sorry, is it was a four-year spread. Sure. You could easily have done $200,000. So Now, personally, I would say that's not the strategy that myself and mm-hmm. my partner use. In fact, we bought something in 2000, end of 2015 that closed in two, uh, summer of 2018. And okay. we had um, offers from other realtors for their clients, um, as well as our own investors asked us that uh, uh, for for us to flip it and assign it. Yeah. And I think we were looking at about one hundred and sixty thousand as a profit. If you flipped it. If we flipped okay, it. So you just signed the paper. Never Literally closed signed it, the paper. Never closed and it. And then you just get a check from a lawyer. That's exactly what yeah. happens. And it was very enticing. <laughs> and as my partner and I had a beer and we discussed, should we do this? Mm-hmm. We came to the conclusion that, look, buying and holding has 
always and will always be, in my opinion, just in my humble opinion, the best strategy because long-term wealth in real estate is created by buying and hold. Absolutely. Again, just my opinion. And as my partner sat, my partner and I sat down, we decided not to flip it because we know that we'll be able to refinance and pull out that hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Yeah. But still hold the asset. And you still get the appreciation, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's. The, one of the only ways legally not to pay taxes because when you're refinancing, <laughs> yeah. you're not selling anything. It's tax free money. It's tax free money. So to make one hundred sixty thousand yeah. dollars net, we're looking at closer to three hundred twenty dollars, yeah. a three hundred twenty thousand dollars gross. So yeah. how many years does the average person need yeah. to work to earn that? Yeah, because the interesting point you bring up because if you sell it, you're going to pay the taxes. Yeah. Maybe work the numbers backwards on just how much difference it really makes to just refinance it and keep it, provided it's an asset that you would like to continue to own. Agree. It works out really nicely. And, and generally speaking, that's what I look to do. I look to refinance them with my own, and I look to keep them. I, I do a lot of student rentals and stuff, not in Toronto. Right. Uh, but, you know, I'm always looking to keep, and it sounds like you are too. Do you have a property manager that's assisting you? I know this is a little side tangent. No, no, not at all. Um, yeah. uh, no, we don't. Um, we do it ourselves. Um, okay. It's why... Um, we work very hard. We work, you know, 12, 13 hour days, but there's some lazy tendencies that we do yeah. have, uh, which is what we like to do is purchase uh, condos in downtown Toronto because mm -hmm. they're 500 square feet. There's not much managing because yeah. they're newer builders, uh, new, uh, newer buildings and newer units, Andrew. What, the most thing that come up is um, a burner on the stove goes. Yeah. Now, the truth of the matter is if I had a property manager, which I would have to pay eight to ten percent mm -hmm. on uh, on the rent. He or she's not going to actually fix that for me. They're going to send the electrician. Right. I have you know I have a tough time um, even hanging a picture on the wall. So I'm going to send somebody anyways. It doesn't yes. matter. Literally, if it's like the door's not the mm -hmm. door's squeaking, like I'm going to send yeah. somebody. And so nowadays with technology, um, especially in a city like Toronto, I literally can write. One, two, three Main Street on Jiffy on demand, or there's so many apps nowadays. Um, and I'll have service providers fighting for a biz the plumber, the electrician, yeah. the handyman. And so we just send them out uh, 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 to get anything fixed from a property management perspective. From actually finding a tenant, it's my business, it's what we do. Yeah. Um, I have a team of 25 realtors, as I mentioned earlier. Someone will always be able to find a renter. I'm right. more than happy um, to pay the half to one month rent yeah. because I always like to calculate time as time. well, what it costs. Um, so yeah, we just, we. We'll put it on MLS yeah. and, and we'll pay the other agent to find a tenant for us. So the operation side doesn't scare you. No. Uh, and then, so I want to jump back into the process. So for somebody who is thinking about maybe buying a pre-construction, yeah. um, we'll, we'll get into the kind of the process. Walk, walk me through, yeah. say your first one, how, you know, what did you buy where? And, and then let's talk how it worked. Okay. So, uh, the first one that we did would have been, um, well, I bought my home, um, was it, which, which helped me because it was a pre-construction home. So I understood mm -hmm. the warranty purposes, but from an investment perspective, it was right downtown Toronto. It was okay. in a project called river city. Um, so, uh, for our Toronto listeners, it's, it's, uh, just South of Front Street East, I apologize, west of DVP. When we went there back in four, 2014, late 2013, I should say, mm -hmm. um, it was a pile of dirt. Okay. And so that's probably the toughest thing to look past, even as somebody in the business, as my first time looking at uh, a pre-construction condo for investment purposes, it was tough to see. Like, the builders and the maps and everything showed us what was going to be happening in this area. Yeah. But when you go and you see a pile of dirt, it's yeah. hard to get past that. Okay. <laughs> so what we did is we like to choose smaller units, um, even as small as 400 square feet, 400 to 650 okay. is, is kind of the sweet spot that I like to look at. Reason being is because they're generally one bedrooms. Obviously the 400 square feet are bachelors or bachelor yeah. units. The rents, uh, sorry, the, the, the tenants that are going to be living in there, they, they'll not want to stay in there for a longer period of time. So when they leave, you can increase the rent to market rents right. when you stay with the smaller units. Why don't they want to stay there a long because time? Because it's, it, it's too small. So it's just a transition It's just home. a transitional place, yeah. right? Um, so imagine yourself and your fiancé, congratulations again, my Thank man. You. Um, you, you're, you're in a 500-square-foot condo. Um, once you get married, one of the jobs might change. 
might start thinking about growing a family. You can't do that in a 500 square mm-hmm. foot condo. You'll leave. We'll bring yeah. in another tenant because it's downtown Toronto. Very easy to do. And we're able to increase the rent to market rents. Okay. okay. Now, in terms of the process, you want to look at uh, location, where tenants are going to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's either downtown Toronto or right off subway lines. Major transit. Yeah. Major, major transit. Yeah. You, um, If you look at any real estate in the last 75 to 80 years in, in Toronto, um, values have always increased the most um, off of uh, uh, major transit hubs mm-hmm. and, and subway lines. Because like you mentioned, it's the one thing that we're v- very much lacking compared to the other major cities in the world yes. is our transit. We got two lines and that's it, right? And so if you can buy real estate off a, an existing subway line or something that, or, or if there's going to be a subway stop that's coming, mm-hmm. be, you're going to win. This is not... Assuming like, they don't change their mind. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? And so we had yeah. a project in Vaughan, um, which is the north part of of, of Toronto, um, where the new subway system just opened yep. up. Uh, subway stop, I apologize, end of 2017. And anyone who purchased in there saw increases of fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 once the subway opened up because everyone knew yeah. it was real. Okay? So you're yeah. essentially, you are buying from, talking about the process again, you are buying from a blueprint. Okay. Which is tough for people because, again, you can't touch, see, and smell the unit. How did you meet the builder that you bought from? So I being in the business, my partner and I being in the business, we just know a lot of builders. Our relationships yeah. are very strong. It's why, not that you need to use us, but we're yeah. more than happy to give you okay. the the, the uh, essentially the insider secrets of how to buy at any time. So you get access to stuff that maybe other people don't? It's very, very important mm-hmm. that you actually buy in the first stages of pricing for okay. pre- construction because you made mention if you see an advertisement in the paper or now online Mm -hmm. it's probably too late i've heard this so so this is i want to touch on this point because i think this is really important and this is one of the things that when my friends send me listings they're like oh check this out you know for new construction they're like this is the price per square foot i'm like Dude, that just hit advertisement. Yeah. I mean, you're late in the game at yes. this point. Uh, I want to know the first guy that got called because that first guy definitely got preferential t- treatment. For sure. Definitely got better pricing. And for me, when I thought about pre-construction, never that I thought about it that seriously, but the first objection that came to mind was, how would I know that I'm getting a deal from that builder? I mean, sure, I can compare it to other projects. Yes. But how would I know that I'm getting a deal? Well, you want to definitely look at what other units are selling mm-hmm. for in in the area so you just yeah. you want to get comparables yeah um but you you uh, to answer your question you want to make sure you're working with a platinum realtor yeah. that has been doing this for a very long time so if you search online in google platinum realtor you will get a billion hits just in toronto alone so a platinum realtor is that just a term around here that's just a term around here what about our listeners you know san francisco we've got people in new york we've got people all over the states listening as well you, you want to see that you want to find out their reputation what other uh, units have they sold and so for example if you're outside of um our city that what i would do so if you put me in norway tomorrow and i wanted to buy mm-hmm. a pre-construction home and or condo i'm going to do the research on mm-hmm. the realtor and how much how many homes they've sold yeah. And, and also ask for referrals. It's okay. the best way to get connected. Networking. Um, or in all honesty, um, call us. Give us a shout. Um, yeah. We'll tell you which projects are in the first staging of yeah. pricing. And because you want to buy, the reason you want to buy in the first stage of pricing, because there's probably five, four to five increments yeah. that the builder will increase the price in. Yes. Okay. And that you, if you buy in the second stage or in the fourth stage, we're talking a difference of $100,000. So easily. It, it makes a huge difference to get in the first stage. It, you, in fact, yeah. don't buy unless you're not buying in the first stage. So I just think this is so important and we, we got to drill down on this. Like, yeah. how is it that, you know, even if they're in Vancouver, yeah. say they don't know, you know, say you're new to Vancouver. Vancouver, you yep. just moved there. How are you, like, what's your first step? If you were thrown into Vancouver tomorrow, yep. who would you call? Well, I'm going to, what would you I, do? I, well, I mean, me being in the business, I'll probably know a majority of the Say builders. you didn't. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so somebody that's not in the business, look, you go ask the builder how many units have been sold. Okay. Okay. Um, they might stretch the truth on that one because they want you to think you're buying uh, uh, in the first stage. Um, you got to have some blind faith and it goes back to the realtor. And I would, find out who is one of the top two to three realtors in vancouver Mm -hmm. okay that are selling pre-construction because i can just tell you if they do 
Like we do about 250 to 300 a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there's someone in that in Vancouver specifically, because they do do a lot of pre-construction. Yeah. If there's someone who's doing two to 300, one of the projects that they're working on is definitely going to be in first access pricing. Mm -hmm. And that's where the blind faith comes in. Yeah. That you need to know that they'll probably give you something and you'll get first access pricing with that realtor. Yeah. If it's someone who does 10 a year, I guarantee you on the other end, Andrew, that they don't have first access pricing. They're not pricing. getting good pricing. They're not because they're only doing yeah. 10 a year. So the builder doesn't look at them as somebody who's going to be able to give them results right. over a longer period of time. You're getting on my next question there Go. is why does the builder want yeah. to work with a realtor to just blow out a bunch of units at low pricing? Well, because what happens is they need to get introductory pricing out. It's easier for the builder to outsource it to realtors because the realtors have clients. Okay. Okay. So the reason they need to get a an influx of units done right out of the gate is because that gives them a sense of what the value is okay. for their units and for their building. As they release at a time, and, and, and it's different in every building, but off the top of my head, you can you can say they'll they'll release twenty five to thirty units at a time. What percentage out of the total building? Say they're building a building, and I don't know how many units would be in the building. Say six hundred or five hundred. Five hundred units 500. in a building. Sometimes it's usually about three hundred. Is the easier number? Okay, so what percentage? Let's just stick with percentages. Yep. Say there's a new tower going up. Yeah. What percentage is the builder going to sell before anything even hits an advertisement? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm thinking they're going to be selling about fifty to sixty percent. And. Um, I don't know if, if you were going to get to this, but one of the things just coming from my financing background is to get bank financing for their construction. Yeah. They need pre-sales. Yeah. So it used to be 75 percent, mm -hmm. um, 70 to 75 percent. The new benchmark is 80 percent now. So. Um, and just just so the listeners understand, when you were driving down the Gardner, which is one of our major highways mm -hmm. that lead us to downtown Toronto and the DVP, there's a lot of cranes going up. In fact, we have yeah. the most cranes uh, uh, going, going up in our city in, in, in all of North America. It beats mm -hmm. out New York, LA, Chicago. Toronto is the most robust when it comes to pre-construction con pre yeah. condos. A lot of people ask the question, right? Who is going to be buying these condos? That's right. not the right question to be asking. It's who's already bought these condos. Because a crane can't go up yeah. unless now 80% of the building is sold because they wouldn't have got the construction financing from the lender. Yeah, now this it may be different a little bit in the States, but it's going sure. to be similar. There is still going to be a requirement, certain number sold, because the bank's not just going to gamble. The bank doesn't gamble. They want certainty, and they give really good interest rates to the builder, and that's for why sure. the builder will do it. Yeah. Yeah, so... And because construction financing is huge for the builder, because they're not going to... There's some builders who can pay cash for these things. They're, such, they're mm -hmm. great builders. That's why the second part of our due diligence is the builder. Right. Because we want to make sure that they've done this and they have a good reputation. Yeah. But they're going to want to leverage. Like you and I as investors, yeah. we want to leverage, right? And so they want to get the construction financing and, and then move on to another project. Yeah, it's going to let them do more. And, and sure. the more you leverage, as you know, holding real estate, the more you can buy and the more profit you <laughs> yeah, get. Exactly. Uh, it, it's just a, a simple formula. So uh, so just to recap on our process, you, you have a relationship or if you're if you're – you know, grassroots in a new city, you you go around, you interview some some builders, yeah. ask them the questions, trust your gut, yeah. find out who the biggest realtors are in that city that are selling pre-construction, interview them as well. See where the story adds up, see where it doesn't, and then yes. start making decisions from exactly. there. Exactly. And now yeah. and then you want to look at floor plans. You wanna mm -hmm. you, you wanna look at um, well, who's gonna be the tenants. Okay. Yeah. Who and then base it around there. So I, I I get a chance to sit down with a lot of investors. Yeah. And you know we hear it a lot where it, it, uh, uh, one of the investors will say, well, I want the room to look like this, mm -hmm. or I want this type of countertops. Tenants don't care, right? Yeah. They're not going to pay for for a lot of these extra add-on mm -hmm. uh, upgrades that the that the builder is going to charge you. You want to look at practicality. Okay. Okay. Obviously, location. We're past that now in our due diligence. So, so, when, so that's assuming you're you're saying no matter what you're getting near transit. You're, you're pick you're a getting, diverse city. Pick a diverse city. People, yeah. Go where the jobs are. Yeah. Because okay. here's the other thing, right? On that, really quickly, Andrew, is that a lot of people say, well, yeah, it comes with the renter the first year. Great, but what's going to happen in year two, three, four, five, and fourteen? Yeah. You got to be able to thinking about buying and holding it. Yeah. We need to make sure that there's a flock and a, a, a huge amount of tenants coming in on a regular basis. Yes. For that, you you want to pick a cookie cutter type of unit that will cast a bigger net right across the board for tenants. So that's why you were asking who who's my tenant because you want to make sure that that 
unit speaks directly to that tenant. It speaks directly to yeah. the yeah. most amount of tenants yeah. as well. Keep it wide open. Keep right? it wide open, right? Um, yeah. So you are obviously looking for um, uh, uh, not being on the first floor, uh, just because there's always been a stigma around yep. the first floor. Resale values, not the best. Um, specifically, again, about Toronto. Views used to be important. I mean, you definitely don't want to be looking at a, a, a at a dumpster, if you mm -hmm. can get away from that. But where it used to be like, well, I want to view uh, into the sky line because of the manhattanization effect there's going to be no views in the next yeah, 10 years right you so, have a view and then a tower goes up three years later and you and, don't and then going up <laughs> yeah. on higher floors yeah yes they'll give you more a higher resale value okay however when you're purchasing it the builder knowing that there's still that thought process with purchasers mm -hmm. getting on a higher floor they'll charge you per floor Right. It used to be a thousand bucks. It's two thousand dollars a floor now, where a tenant most of the time will not pay you extra rent just because you're on the thirtieth floor compared to um, a Clem's unit on the twentieth floor. Okay. Okay. And so uh, I don't get too tied up on which floors I'm on, um, as long as I'm not really on the first. Floor. So you won't go the first. Will you go on the third? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Now, if um, uh, uh, on the third floor facing west, uh, uh, I'm looking at the dumpster. Her, I probably will try to get on on, on a yeah. higher floor looking the other way. It's why the yeah. other reason it's not just pricing getting in that first access. It's also choice of uh, units. Okay. Because obviously out of a out of a building when they're going to release uh, uh, thirty units at a time, those thirty yeah. units that they're releasing, you're going to get first access to them. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk more about about the economic drivers because uh, I, I do want to dig into that more. But I want to keep going through this process. Uh, yeah. So you've got your relationship. You look for the floor plans. You're in a good area. Yeah. Um, you're getting a tenant. Yeah. Eventually, what's you know that's that's down the road when you actually close. But there's this huge gap from when you sign the original agreement yeah. to when you actually close. What happens between those times? Crickets. And you watch paint dry. It's, this this type of investment is probably the most boring type of investment mm -hmm. around. Um, and I know you do a lot of other types of investments other than student housing that are very similar. Which yeah. I which you know we do a lot of business in that sense together. When from when you buy to when it closes, there's not much to do. It's very passive. It's why it's become such a high demand type of investment because mm -hmm. the down payment structure is um, it's paid in increments, okay? So as an investor, as we know, we need to pay 20% total down, right. okay? And so within that two and a half, three year period, you're gonna do two, 5% in uh, uh, 30 days, 5% in six months, okay? 5% in a year, so or, or five in 5% 5 in a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Because it's paid out over time, you can get flexible with the money. You can keep it under your pillow, yeah. under your mattress if you'd like, or you can get into short-term mortgages. Okay. Take the interest from that short-term mortgage, maybe for a term of one year. Yeah. You might know somebody who does that. Yeah, I know some people. You <laughs> might know some people that know some people. And take that interest, profit, and your principal, and use that for your down payment. Absolutely. Right? So it's why it's become mm -hmm. such a, not only a lucrative investment, yeah. but because it's become so high in demand because you don't have to come up with a full down payment because if you buy a resale condo yeah. and the closing is in 90 days yeah. you have to come up with the full down payment in 90 right. days so you, you've got some time that's the nice thing like most time when people buy on market you have to close in 90 days right yeah. like you said so you're coming up full 20 now in this case you can kind of slowly work into it or if you know you'll have some money coming available maybe you're in another investment yeah uh, you, you can time it that's a great point and for anyone curious about private mortgage lending and what that's all about episode two uh, on my podcast I with Jake it. Campanero. Jake was on it. Uh, Jake's probably sitting outside the room he right now. <laughs> Jake, ears are burning, Jake. <laughs> big, big, big shout out to Jake because yeah. um, uh, he put us together. Yes, absolutely. Uh, more importantly, he is on uh, on our team as well. Yeah. Who is, uh, he's just, uh, he's a rock star. I'm not just saying yeah. that because he's outside, but uh, I see his work ethic. Um, I'm sure, you know, th there's that saying, right? The apple doesn't fall far from yeah. the tree. So big shout out to uh, Carmen as well because she, yeah. like, this guy just, he's a beast. 
I like that family, the Campaneros. They're, they're all right. <laughs> you have no choice now to say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm marrying into that family. Uh, but no, like they're all, you know, they're all achievers in their own right. Um, Carmen at the top, you know, I, Carmen was on episode, I forget the number, but look up yeah, Carmen yeah, yeah. Campanero. That episode has done incredibly well. She was talking about her success and development. Awesome. And, um, you know, just a, a super achiever, which uh, is super inspiring, always has been. Well, look, look yeah. even, even, even the short-term private lending, yeah. Uh, stuff that you spoke about and, and yeah. obviously what uh, ProFunds does. It's um, very similar to the pre-construction condo investing because mm -hmm. it's passive. Yes. Okay. Um, there is obviously some differences where with 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 the short term lending you have fixed returns generally you're getting monthly payments versus you're this monthly, you're not right with, with this you're not here you're owning a unit mm -hmm. right. As from a high level investor discussion, I always start with telling my investors that there's benefits to every single type of investment, mm -hmm. but don't get caught up into it until you understand the things you need to consider. Yes. So with pre-construction condo investing, you, when you purchase, you automatically in Ontario get a 10 day due diligence period, also known as a 10 day cooling period right where the government has said because there's a con there's con it's a condominium and there's actual condo docks yep a purchaser needs 10 days to cool off relax chill make sure they made mm -hmm. the right decision didn't get uh, uh, pushed into doing something where within that 10 days you need to take those documents and guys they're like this thick and yeah like your realtor won't even read through it okay okay in fact when you sign nowadays um, it's done on an iPad you go boop boop Five buttons, yeah. five, five presses, and you're done, right? And so um, you get those 10 days to get those documents reviewed, okay. okay? Then and only then, when you're comfortable, you let those 10 days expire and move on. Now, right. within that time period of after the 10 days to when the building gets built, your deposits that you've given, they're locked in. Yep. You're not getting them back. You can't get them back. We can yeah. use the assignment clause, but you yeah. can't. You can't use the assignment clause because even in the documents, it's written that most of the time, all documents are a little are, are, are different. That you can't assign it until the building is ninety percent sold because the builder doesn't want you to compete with them right. and undercut their pricing. Mm -hmm. As well as um, some type of uh, uh, line will state that it uh, the construction needed to start or it needs to be up to the fifth or the sixth floor, something mm -hmm. like that. So you need to know that that there's no like um, jazz, Andrew. I changed my mind. I want my money back. If it's after the ten days, yeah, you know. And so fifteen years, we haven't lost people's deposits. We don't like to start now. Right. Absolutely. Now, I, I would say, obviously, you've been quite fortunate in Toronto uh, with this market. Yeah. It's just been going up and up and up. And I'll tell you the things that I like about Toronto. I, I've always looked at it as this city that even in, in, in a, a, a crash down the road, yeah. if and when it happens, I mean, obviously, there's a cycle. Sure. It's hard to keep a city like Toronto down because of its diversity, because of the demand to live there. Because of the things that you've said, because it's it's got water on one side and a green belt, which you can't build on on the other. So you're basically isolated. The only way you can build is up. We're in an so, island. Yeah, basically yeah. an island, although <laughs> it's not fully an island. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's it's like, it's like got that Manhattan effect in yeah. that there's nowhere else to go but up. And and that means each parcel of land is going to get more expensive. And, and because development is not allowing enough new units to match the, the influx of people into Toronto right now. And talking about the influx of people, it's yeah. 125,000 people coming into the greater Toronto year mm -hmm. uh, uh, area year over year for the next 10 years. Yeah. These are immigration Canada stats. It's not yes. jazz making these things up. Yeah. What they cannot calculate, but what they guesstimate is uh, 250,000 over the next 10 years uh, for net migration. Right. So in the next 10 years in total, we're going to be looking at about 1.5 million people. Okay. okay? 1.5 million people. We need approximately a half a million households. Mm -hmm. Okay. On a, on a good year, we produce about uh, 30,000. So extrapolate that for the 10 years. We, we're only going to be doing 300,000 households. We need 500. Mm -hmm. Basic, basic supply and demand. Yes. We're in trouble. It's an epidemic. This is not like I'm just making these numbers yep. up. We need more housing. They need to figure right. it out now. I mean, kudos to the guys who are trying to figure this out because, as you said, water on one side, green belt on the other. Do we start cutting down the trees? I don't think I'm happy with that. I got a five-year-old and a three-year-old, right? And so right. we need to think that through. Um, the whole lane housing and stuff that they're coming out within the city now, 
great huge advantages it's going to help but i think i read the number i think it only allows for another like eight thousand households lane housing lane so there's gonna be like you can you literally convert a garage okay in, in the in, in the downtown toronto area yeah. there's lanes to get to these houses yeah. in the back off the main street mm -hmm. you can convert one of your garages into a home Okay. Okay. And so that's going to, but it's, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a drop in the bucket. Compared to what we need. And we're seeing that all across Ontario. Yeah. All, all the municipalities are adding in something that yeah. you can add in granny suites, uh, secondary suites. Yeah. They're trying to answer this call for more housing. Yeah. There is a call. Uh, and it, I love that you mentioned supply and demand. That's what it always is. It's always supply and demand, no matter where you are. Yeah. If you're looking for a place to, to invest in pre-construction, you're yeah. going to want to look to a strong, diverse economy where if it, if it were to crash, yeah. it's going to come back quickly because because of the diversity, right? Yeah. What are the drivers there? In Toronto, we've got all this industry, all this tech. It's set up. It takes a long time for these companies to move out. And why would they, right? right. The people that work there are here. Uh, they're close to the borders. There's all these things that aren't going to just change tomorrow. And we're not talking about small companies either, right? So yeah. Uber, I, I don't think they're going anywhere. Probably not. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about the big boys. Google, okay. yeah. um, uh, Shopify. This yeah. is just what we're, this is where we're heading yeah. um, with, in terms of how we're going to be buying. Um, Amazon obviously didn't make the call to come here, but they opened up. They're, they're opening up a new distribution center in Caledon, Bolton to be exact. Um, okay. And so uh, when we always have had the, the the major banks head offices here, yes, which is one of the you know biggest factors in terms of employment. Yeah. Um, and then schools. Uh, uh, colleges and you also have uh, hospitals as well, right? And you're on All water. that down, you have to, uh, right on the water, and you have it right downtown Toronto. Yes. And and even though transit it, it hasn't been good, I, what I've just noticed is a lot more people just biking mm -hmm. and walking, yep. and and so it's why even parking now, Andrew, if you're purchasing a new condo in downtown Toronto, it's about to mm -hmm. touch eighty thousand on some projects. A, a parking spot. A parking spot to buy. To buy. Okay, so wow. to, just to make it, just to put it into perspective, Manhattan is at 250 grand for a parking spot. And so when we hear, like, and I hear it a lot, right, where it's not affordable jazz. Yeah, I get it, but you got to drive till you qualify. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, that's just what happens mm -hmm. in, in, in major cities. The average person cannot buy in Manhattan, London, Tokyo. We had our, our, our executive producer, Laura, she was in London and she sent us a picture of uh, a, a flyer that was at about 400, sorry, it was $2,800 price per square foot, okay? Canadian dollars. Canadian dollars, $2,800 price per square foot, okay? That, oh, when we're buying yeah. pre-construction, yeah. we're always basing it on price per square yes. foot numbers, okay? Yeah. So $2,800 in London. 20 minutes. 20 minutes from the core, not even in the core, okay? So in the core, let's just add a a, a, a little bit to it. And I, I think it's safe to say it would probably be $3,200, $3,500 of price per square foot. Toronto, right now, yeah. downtown Toronto, in the core, is selling for, I would say, close to thirteen to $1,400, mm -hmm. okay? Manhattan, $3,000, $3,500 all day long price per yeah. square foot. Tokyo, Shanghai. Paris it seems to be the way it's going. Seem, it, it, they're all at that price point where yeah. really the only people that think Toronto real estate is expensive is people in Toronto. People who are from Toronto, and and it's just hard to believe, right? Your reference to uh, to London, England, is. Um, you know, most people don't own there. And I mentioned this a lot. Yeah. I think it's something like 98% of, of the units there are owned by an investor, not by the person living in it. Right. And uh, that really says something. And I, I've, I've pondered this a lot. Is this the direction that not just Toronto is going, but, yeah. but the greater areas of, of Canada? Because one consistent trend has been because of this supply and demand issue where there's not yeah. enough supply is we're seeing prices go up everywhere and affordability for the average Canadian right now is is it's definitely more difficult like they're getting into a position where they're having to pay more to live yes than people used to have to definitely I, I also just think that especially with the younger generation um, they're just they're, their expectations are gonna have to come down right mm -hmm. where um, I'm 37 now um, but when I bought my first home when I was 25 mm -hmm. um, I was I purchased a 2,500 square foot home, 25 to 30 minute drive outside of Toronto, um, mm -hmm. in in Brampton, and 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 now, the younger generation they're just gonna have to live with something smaller. You got to stomach less of a home, or they got to hustle more, <laughs> or hustle more. Right now, yeah. really, I truly believe um, 
now going off on a super tangent, that most people should be buying smaller places anyways. Yeah. Um, I just hear it a lot that my cousin bought 2,500 square feet, so I need to buy 2,600. Yes. It's it's the old keeping up with the Joneses. Um, you know, in Brampton, we call it keeping up with the Sings because they're just always, <laughs> yeah. the, no matter what, we're always trying yeah. to keep up, right? If you can stomach a, a, a smaller home, then you can get into the world that we're in and invest. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to have a situation where you're you're either net saving or you're you're able to invest in some other way. So, I've heard tons of people house hack. I had a guy on the show that in two and a half years he went from owning no real estate and right. just working a full time job to right. building up a portfolio, and he has over ten thousand dollars a month in passive income. Christ, two that's and a half amazing. years. Uh, th- just just hear that somebody did that, yeah. and he house hacks, so he'll live in one unit, he'll renovate it, yeah. move around, and so he's making small sacrifices. He's yeah. still in his twenties. Right. If you're willing to to do things like that, then you can save up. And he started with, I think he said he saved 120 grand. That's not a small amount. He no. saved that by just being frugal. There you go. In his you know his early 20s, and that was what he started with to build his portfolio. He just went in, bought, renoed, refinanced, recycled the money. Different strategy. We've talked about that a lot on the show. Yeah, and look, I yeah. I, I think there's definitely something to thinking big. Um, yeah. Not only from a real estate perspective, it could be from a business perspective, yeah. health perspective, whatever it is. Um, I'm all about that. Yeah. When it comes specifically to investing into real estate. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a broker, so I, I have an ins- uh, I have an incentive for you to think big and purchase a lot. Yeah. But what I really like to get across to people is, even if you just bought one, yep. great, let's do 20 investments, let's do 52, let's do 10, whatever it is, whatever you have the appetite for. Mm-hmm. But even if you just bought one, we can teach you ways to refinance, buy more. But even yes. if you never refinance it, you buy one and it's in 20 years, 25 years max, it's going to be paid off. You're going to rent it. There's going to be some small things you're going to need yeah. to do. Find a renter, put some paint on a wall. That's it. Yeah. And it's going to be paid off. It's going to be worth a lot more than it's worth now, in Toronto, mm-hmm. it's safe to say in the greater Toronto area, and again, for the out-of-province and uh, uh, out-of-country listeners and viewers, that's about a 100-kilometer radius, which is the greater Toronto area. Yeah. We have seen prices double every 10 years, yeah. like clockwork. Okay, so in um, every 10 years, you're going to have something that's going to be worth double what you bought it for. Right. And in 20 years, it's going to be paid off. It's just it's a, it's a really basic concept. It's just a, you got to take action. Take that leap right. of faith. Now, for me personally, I haven't invested in an area that's done that. Now, in the last few years, it's gone crazy in London, Ontario. Um, it's it, This is one of those things where, yeah, you are sort of banking on this. But I can say even at, a say, 3% a year, if you're getting 3% a year on your yep. investment, yep. this is what I, I repeatedly say. If I have a $500,000 property on a 30-year mortgage, in 30 years, I'm going to have the mortgage paid off, and that property is probably going to be worth a million. Yep. Each property I own yep. makes me a millionaire one time over. So, that's it. And that's just if you can just sit still and, and be patient through the ups and downs, not be a knee-jerk reactor where you just, oh, it went down, I need to sell before it goes down more. No, understand that when markets go down, people still need a place to live. Yes. And, and they will still when the market comes back. You right. only lock in your loss when you sell. And when, and, and when markets go down, rates go up generally mm-hmm. speaking, interest rates, so borrowing costs go up. Mm-hmm. For a tenant, it just made it harder for them to buy because right. the cost of borrowing is higher and they, they're not going to be able to afford something. So what's yeah. going to happen? You're going to see more tenants in the marketplace. Yeah. And if you can just hold on and be patient, as you said, Andrew, yeah. and don't get sucked into the markets dropping, just hold on. There will always be tenants. And be patient. You're, gonna, you're going to see some huge wins in real estate. But you got to right. buy and hold. You do have to buy and hold, um, and to hold, you got to buy first, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and it just—it just is what it is. And you got to pick a strategy that you're going to be comfortable with. Now, yeah. I'm a cash flow guy, uh, so I know you're saying like more of a break-even strategy yes. when you're buying, which yes. is still still good as long yeah. as you're not losing money. Yeah. But you do need to have a little bit of a buffer yes. in case something major comes up. I you never know. Totally agree. Yep. So here's where I want to have a conversation about where this type of investing fits in a per- portfolio, yeah. because. There are some people out there with a high need for cash, and those are the people such as the gentleman I referenced who retired, you know, he, he's just about to quit his job two and a half years in, yep. and he's two and a half years into investing, so he's going to be relying on that cash flow to live. Got it. There are other people such as yourself where you're working full time, you're doing your passion, uh, you don't need the, the, the monthly cash flow, yep. where you're saying, in my portfolio, I really don't care because I'm ready to work another, another 20 or 30 years. 
you have to figure. So for me, I, I figured this market makes sense at roughly maybe five to ten percent of my portfolio. I like my cash flow, but this this does have a place. Not everything needs to cash flow. And 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 yeah. and, and this is also not to cut you off. I it's not for everyone either. Yeah. Like I want to start that. This is not. Yeah. Everyone should buy pre-construction because it's a no. No. You it's have to think about your own needs. Hundred percent. Where are you as an investor? Yeah. Like, what do you need as an investor to to get to where you want to go? Right. Yeah. If your goal is just cash flow, it doesn't make sense to buy something no. that won't. No. But if your goal is to to have a huge nest egg at retirement and you've got a thirty year purview yeah. and you can wait thirty years to yeah. sell it or even twenty, you don't actually typically need that. I would say. No. I, I would say bare minimum if you're not thinking at least ten years. Down the road, your your mind. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, investors that I have seen wait just even the five year mark okay. who want cash flow. So if you're looking for cash flow, you're not going to get it from a monthly perspective, yep. positive. You're going to get that break even. But what happens in five years, in the five year period with pre construction, is you have the three year build. Yep. Okay, that it takes, and then two years you should mm -hmm. wait out because all the other guys who. Are, who, who are on the market, you don't want to be a commodity in the marketplace. You want the, mm -hmm. the, the, the construction dust to be gone. It's landscaped the build, the, the, yeah. around the building. The lobbies are complete. But then you also have the financial dust that you want to clear. The corporation's set up now. The maintenance fees are what they should be, you know, with small little increments uh, uh, in okay. terms of increases. But if you sell in the five-year mark, you'll yeah. also see some profit. Divide that into five years. Yeah. You'll, still see, you, you'll, you'll work the numbers and get some really good cash flow that way. It just doesn't come sure. in, the, in the form of a monthly payment. Right, right. Well, and just to clarify my previous point, yeah. I wasn't saying that you couldn't sell it in five years mm. based on the way things are going, yes. have been going. Yes. Heck, you could sell it in two years and make oh money. Oh, my God, yes. But here's the, here's the thing. It could slow down. It yeah. could stop for 10 years. Yeah. So when I say you should you should think at least 10 years out, be willing to think 10 years yes. out. Yes. Like saying, what if the worst happens? And I'm going through this right now on a project that I'm, I'm looking at doing. Because I've made mistakes in the past, and right. because I've been burned, yeah. and I don't know if you have, yeah. we'll, we'll get into that. But because those things have happened to me, I've, I've realized that I need to have a really good plan A, but my plan B and C need to be rock solid. Yeah. So if you can't be comfortable, so my plan A is I'm going to go in and buy pre-construction, yeah. and my plan B is uh, you know, I'll sell it. Well, if plan B doesn't work because the market crashed, what do you do if that doesn't work? You know, What's your plan C? And you just need to make sure you've got that full chronology of these are all the things I would do. Yeah. If and when, and make sure you're comfortable with all of them. And uh, as long as that's true, I think that you can make that work for you. Look, I, it always starts with mm -hmm. a, a, co a coffee with us. Mm -hmm. And w w when I'm sitting down with investors, we ask the question of what's mm -hmm. the goal here? What are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. Is it cash flow? Are yeah. you okay? Are we thinking about creating wealth in real estate? Because yeah. then we can talk about that and, and it's a little different conversation. But if it's, no, I need the monthly cash flow for yeah. whatever purpose, then pre-construction, we should let's just put that to the side right. and let's talk about student housing. I mean, that's one of the best type of investments around for cash flow. There's also multiplexes and duplexes. Even in here Toronto. in Toronto? Even here in Toronto. You even here in it. Toronto. Student housing, not as much mm -hmm. um, because the city is definitely cracking down. So if you can find something that is regulated um, and you might need to go outside of the greater Toronto area into the southern Ontario market areas like Kitchener Waterloo and, right. and Kingston um, for student housing investments yeah in Toronto generally speaking Andrew from an investor's perspective it's a very passive safe investment you don't see a lot mm -hmm. of cash flow in fact big REITs um, as well as like the pension plans the, they're all investing in Toronto because it's just a safe place to invest. They know that long term they're going to get the passive right. appreciation and they know that they have a steady flow of tenants. It's yeah. not really a cash flowing place. That's why the, that's why the returns uh, from a cash flow point aren't there because exactly. everybody wants it, right? Exactly. You want the cash flow, you go to where people can't quite see it yet. And if you're a keen investor, you will see how these these fringe markets or the ones that are outside on the outskirts, these, these developing areas, yeah. If you know what to look for, you'll know how to spot those too. For sure. It's a different market because it could be hit worse by a downturn. Yeah. Uh, you're more you're more subject to volatility from economic forces. Does if one major manufacturer leaves a town of twenty thousand people, that hurts. We've seen that happen a yeah. lot as well, right? I mean, even in just outside the GTA into Oshawa, which is kind of borderline GTA outside. Yeah. Um, uh, the Chrysler plant left, mm -hmm. and and so there's not as many tenants now. 
that are yeah. renting in the area. It still didn't affect it at a huge, like a grander scale because yeah. there, because there's still a 30 minute transit mm-hmm. ride in on the gold train into downtown Toronto. So a lot of people who are living there weren't just living there because of the Chrysler plant. They yeah. wanted to, uh, because they couldn't afford downtown Toronto, they were living in an area like Oshawa. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, that's the, the big thing with Oshawa. It's an, it's an outskirt town for those who aren't familiar. Yeah. And it's right on the major transit line yes. for, for Go Transit, which yeah. is a train that goes right downtown Toronto. So yeah. so you've got access. Again, we're going back to that major transit. And, and crazy, I don't know how people do this, yeah. but people drive from where I live in Burlington uh, on the Go Train to, to Toronto, yeah. and it's almost almost an hour. I know. And they do that on a daily basis. The average, the average travel yeah. time is uh, uh, to and from work is about an hour and 45 minutes for a GTA resident. Yeah. That's why you should spend all your time listening to podcasts. I was just going to say, Mine plug- and Andrews, we think a lot. simple. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you're on the go train, yeah, yeah. put in those earbuds and yeah, throw, exactly. on, throw on our podcast. Exactly. We should keep you busy. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm thinking that's why podcasts are growing. I, I yeah. think that's exactly why they're growing um, yeah. because it takes no extra time, right? So yeah. um, obviously video still is the holy grail and yeah. the mothership in that sense, but I think there's a huge transition happening into the podcast audio world because it takes no extra time for us to do something. A video yeah. I need to still watch. Yeah, well, right? passive listening, right? You're yeah. kind of you're kind of in and out, and yeah. you know, a good point's made, and all of a sudden you tune back in. Yeah. Of course, not when you're listening to ours; you're tuned in the whole time. Obviously, but, um, that's why my videographer is always scared because <laughs> he's think he's he's going to be out of a job once audio takes fully over, which I can't wait for. But yeah. uh, I love <laughs> audio; I really do because I yeah. I spend most of my time now in the in the car listening to an audiobook and yeah. or a podcast, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Jazz, to give it some context, yeah. um, when did you do your first pre-construction deal? What year? 2013, end of. Okay, so how many have you closed on? So we've closed on three so far, and I have three more closing. Okay. Yeah. And I know some of it's hypothetical, uh, but on the ones that you... I actually you, think they're all downtown Toronto. I'm just thinking that through. They're, yeah, all, they're all downtown Toronto. All downtown Toronto. Yeah. So so for those who aren't familiar with Toronto, those are that, those are high high mar- numbers in terms of value. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, if you're in Toronto. Yeah. So yeah. let me put it a, a little bit more into context for you. So as I mentioned that the average is about $1,300 uh, uh, price per square, square, square foot now. Now. Um, the ones I bought in 2013, 14, 15 all ranged from $500 a square foot to 700 Mm -hmm. i bought two last year uh that uh sorry last year was 18 so end of 17 that what the highest one that i bought was at 850 dollars a price per square foot so you're you could do instant instant equity wise yeah uh on the ones you've closed on average how much instant equity did you have and i mean so you bought it for one price and when you closed it was immediately worth something else well okay so let's just i'll I'll give you exact numbers so the one that i bought in 2013 uh bought that for 500 dollars a square foot um it was a little over 500 square feet so it came in at a little under uh uh, 300 Mm -hmm. okay 285 or something like that uh had i had to put 20 percent down so that got built in 2000 late 16 to 17 mm-hmm. okay uh so i had the 20 percent down on that which is sixty thousand. had a mortgage of two hundred and forty thousand. okay okay um and in 2016 that was worth close to four hundred thousand dollars okay so you so were, 400 you were subtract, already up over subtract the 400 to 240 yeah okay and what are we at a buck 60. so you're up 160 on something yeah. 400 to close yeah Wow. Yeah. Or, or well, two sixty, two forty to close. Two forty, and, and to you close. had an immediate value of four hundred. Four hundred. That's incredible. It, and we refinanced mm-hmm. at that time because now I own it. Yeah. Took the money. Went another to one. another one. <laughs> yeah. Like I could. Yeah. And here's the cool thing with the refinancing: we talked about tax free. That's one thing. If I wanted to, luckily myself and my partner don't have any bad habits, i.e., like gambling and all that kind of stuff. Not to say whoever does it, that's up to you. It's just that we don't. Mm-hmm. We could have went to Vegas and spent it. Yeah. And the government, they're not going to tax us on it. We yeah. also don't like flashy stuff, really. Yeah. We could have spent it on the flashy stuff. So I'm not, I, I can't remember 100% if we took all of it. I know we put some into our business because that really yeah. is our passion. Um, and and now we're just building out a portfolio. We're young guys. Um, and, and, you know, we always say we need to get to 15 to 20 million worth of real estate because there's two of us. So yeah. it's actually 20 million. And if I'm at 10 million on my own of of real estate that I own yeah. that is paid off. 
if you look at a 4% return on that, when it's all yeah. paid off, it's a $400,000 residual income to me when I'm 65 years old. Sounds wonderful. Right? And so um, if anything else hits the fan in mm-hmm. terms of the business doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, yeah. um, if I just keep my real estate and hold on to it, still yeah. refinance it before that period of time, um, at a time where it's all paid off, it's worth $10 million, we can take a, an average return that we've seen over a, a long period of time of 4%. Yeah. We're making $400,000 a year. And yeah. you know, divide that into monthly. It's a nice little income residual. Right. And once you retire, you don't need to live in downtown Toronto. You can make that go far. A hundred percent. There's a or, lot of places. You, you know what? Live. I met with investors yeah. yesterday and I made mention of that yesterday. And the wife looked over at me and she said, but I want to go to I want to go on cruises and I want to mm-hmm. live a better lifestyle. I'm like, you can do that, too. <laughs> Airbnb your house out. Exactly. Head on. Head we didn't on even talk down. about Airbnb oh, and yeah. what you can do with downtown uh, in, in condos yeah. with Airbnb. Sure. because It's just easier to manage. It's a crazy market. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's a whole episode on its own. A hundred percent. What's one thing you would recommend to somebody thinking like the one most important thing yeah. about somebody thinking about getting started in the pre-construction um, is get educated get okay. educated uh, uh, by by asking the right questions uh, you yeah. know we were joking about listening to podcasts but definitely whatever which way you consume information yeah. um, is definitely get educated and um, I'll give you two pieces is take the the leap of faith take okay. action um, and and because the money that I'm talking about that we've made, that's one of thousands of stories. Yeah. Thousands. This is not some would say it's speculating, but I would I, I would venture to say no, it's it's a very educated investment mm-hmm. and an educated guess uh, because we have so much history. That's told us what's happening in the marketplace. It's a yo-yo on an escalator. I, I, I like forget it. where I first heard that, yeah. but real estate is a yo-yo on an escalator. You will have your ups and downs yeah. as you go up. It goes up and down. Yeah upwards <laughs> on an upward trend exactly, right so you right? got to be willing to stomach all that for sure you know it's like the, you buy stocks you don't look at it every day because it's always up and down you can't day yeah. trade real estate no you know that's not what you do here yeah. you think about it long term um and put the right team around you mm-hmm. as well uh, because you there's no, there's just no way that you would know what questions to ask because there's no there's what you know yeah. and then there's what you don't know that you don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So same token, I like to do the other side. Cool. What's one thing you would absolutely say not to do? Um, is not get educated. I yeah. know that's kind of an easy okay. cop so just out. the other side it, of it, it's, yeah. It really is the other side of it because yeah. um, people get, it, l- l- let me elaborate more on that, Andrew. Don't, like Google's a great start, but mm-hmm. it's not everything. So Google's not everything. Um, great place to start, but don't just use Google as your place. And yeah. so get the team around you, um, finance team, realtor team, legal team. Network. That's network. Yeah, build your network. Um, I've said this before, and we were talking about this before the podcast. Yeah. One of the biggest reasons, Jazz, when you asked me why did I start this, I wanted to build my network more. Right. I wanted to build the sphere of investors around me because right. I know that when you network, everybody grows. Yeah. And it just takes things to a new level. You never even know what opportunities come. Oh, yeah. So the more people you get around who know what they're doing sure. and are doing things, your story inspires me. It inspires other people. And it gives it gives me one more thing that I can look at yeah. as, okay, where is this going to fit in my portfolio? When am I going to do that? Look, man, I mean, yeah. you and I have uh, are in very similar circles, but we've never met before. Yeah. Really. Like we, I, we passed by. We passed by I, literally I aware in of you. hallways. Yeah, I know yeah. you're there. You know I'm here kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but as I think about... Yeah. You know, uh, someone who comes to me now that mm-hmm. would want a a uh, a deal from a student housing perspective and or a, a private lending, you're going to mm-hmm. be top of mind now. No right. matter what, you'll be top of mind um, because we're doing this. So the Absolutely. networking is is probably. I mean, that's it, it, it's the biggest lesson I've ever sure. learned um, in business is is get to know people because you just yeah. never know their story. So, Jazz, on that note, I know we're kind of hitting the one-hour mark. Uh, if somebody wanted, you know, someone listening to my podcast wanted to learn more about you and what you do, what's the best place for them to go? Go to recanada.com. 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 Um, or you can go to our YouTube page, which is youtube.com forward slash REC experience just to get a ton of free content. Yeah, yeah, all just the free like content yours, there. Yeah, you're gonna hear uh, Jazz's perspective on on things. Yeah, which consume it. You know, use this content because this is like building your network. But you know, you're on the go train or you're you're driving yeah. to work or what have you. For sure. Look, yeah. I, uh, when we're talking about the travel time. 
the average person is going to spend an equivalent of a four-year degree mm -hmm. in their car. Yeah. That's how much we spend in our car. Make use of it. Yeah. Right? Um, if you already have a degree, well, you can, you know, quadruple down on that now. It's right. the university on wheels. Yeah, exactly. I, love that. I, I learned like that. that. I I learned, uh, I like that. Brian Tracy's, that was like the first personal like development book I ever read. I think yeah. it was The Art of Closing. Okay. And I University like on Wheels. He's been around for a very, very, very long, long time. time. And it, it just, the number one lesson I took from that, get educated. Yes. Like constantly, constantly. Sure. Don't waste time watching Netflix. Yeah. Immerse yourself in something that's going to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, look, I mean, you can escape. Like last night, yeah, I, a little bit. I yeah. escaped yeah. with obviously. Not the best news with the Leafs losing, but yeah. uh, other than that, I think yeah. I think you you, you yeah. need to look. I, I, if you're doing something that you're passionate about, yeah. you'll always be pulled towards it, sure. right? It, yeah. There's not really much that you yeah. need to get motivated about because it's it's essentially pulling yeah. you, right? So yeah. Okay, so for anyone who wants to get a hold of me um, at the Andrew Hines on either Facebook or Instagram is the easiest way. And um, before we go, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. Sure. So, uh, favorite hobby? Favorite hobby is uh, doing this, working and uh, on podcasts. It's it's. I haven't worked uh, in the last fifteen years, to be honest with you. I, I am doing my hobby. I love that answer. Yeah, really. yeah I love really. that answer. If it feels like work, yeah. uh, delegate it. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> I got sure. I got some work to do on that. Yeah, I got right a, now. I got a big team around me that yeah. I'm very lucky because I, they yeah. allow me to delegate yeah. a lot, um, which keeps me in uh, conversations okay. like this, as well as high-level conversations with investors. I haven't worked in 15 years, Andrew. Okay, and then one mentor to you, whether it be an author of a book yeah. or somebody who hosts their own podcast, you know, yeah. who's been a major influence on you? Uh, I would have to say my dad. Okay. Um, uh, I have a lot of mentors from the podcast uh, author realm, yeah. um, but by far the number one has been my dad because I just saw, I learned work ethic from him. Was he an investor um, or no, he was actually wasn't. Um, he was a taxi driver his whole life. Um, not educated. Um, but, uh, uh, he just worked his ass off every single day yeah. and, uh, uh, still made as much time as he possibly could for his three sons. I have two older brothers and, uh, he, he, he's the guy. He's the okay. guy for me for sure, man. Nice. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And, uh, what's one thing that people, most people don't know about you? I can touch my tongue to my nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he just did it. If it, So, yeah, hop on YouTube and you can see that. Um, all right. That was great. Okay, Jazz, thanks so much for, for doing this with me. You this were is, awesome, buddy. This is great. You were amazing. Yeah, really, really enjoyed this. And it was great because this is so different from everything else I've done on the podcast so far. So I really awesome. like it. Thanks a lot, man. All right, I thanks, really man. appreciate your time. Thank you, buddy. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next one.